Hey everyone, this is Nick, and as you can see from the background, I am not home. But that's not going to prevent me from bringing you all the Linux and open source news that you might want for this week. This time we have Adobe planning to make Photoshop on the web free for everyone. Except it's Adobe, so of course there's gonna be some paid features. Then we have Thunderbird merging with the K9 mail client on Android to make Thunderbird for Android. And we have a nasty Linux malware that seems pretty adept at concealing itself on various servers. And of course, we also have tons of updates to GNOME, to KDE, we have Plasma 5.25, and a lot of other things, including a nice Fairphone subscription service. A nice service, you say? Well, I've got another one for you, and that's today's sponsor, who's gonna give you $100 free credit for your own Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer, select a few configuration options and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment, but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. You can block mine, but it's gonna make me even poorer. From Focal Board, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credits and get started. The Thunderbird team announced their plans to put Thunderbird on Android in the near future. The blog post, written by my friend Jason Evangelo of Linux for Everyone fame, explains their reasoning behind this and how they will approach the move to the mobile OS. It looks like members of the Thunderbird team approached the developer of K9 Mail, one of the best open source email clients for Android, back in 2018 and that this collaboration will start bearing fruits really soon. K9 Mail will transform, in the future, into Thunderbird for Android, which means that Thunderbird will contribute financially to the Mail client to add brand new features and more quality of life enhancements. There will be auto configuration for accounts, improved folder management, support for message filters, and syncing between desktop and mobile Thunderbird. It looks like it made more sense to work with an existing client than to redevelop something from the ground up. And that won't affect the pace of development of the desktop client, which is still on a nice path to pick up an improved user experience in its future release. It's really cool to see this email client picking up Steam, being actively worked upon, and I guess an Android app really can't hurt the brand recognition and it can only help push open source further. So I'll be awaiting eagerly for the new Android client that I'll try out and the revamped desktop client that should arrive in the coming month. Plasma 5.25 was released, one of the biggest updates to the desktop environment in the KDE Plasma 5 series. Among other changes, the headline feature is floating panels, which look really cool and add some flair to your desktop. There's also a lot more work on accent colors, letting you pick the color from the wallpaper, apply it to the title bars, or even tint all the colors with the accent color so your desktop feels more personal. And the touch mode for touchscreens and tablets is now a lot better and can be toggled manually. Touch gestures are also vastly improved on Wayland. They are smoother, faster, and follow your finger's movement on the touchpad or your touchscreen. Oh, and there's also new screen edge gestures for touchscreens. Discover now displays more important information about applications and a lot more. And of course, I made a video about this brand new release and it's filled with dumb jokes. So go check it out in the card up top somewhere here or there or in the link in the description. It's really a fantastic release. If you own an iPad and use Linux on your computer, you might regret the lack of that famous continuity feature from macOS that would, among other things, let you use your iPad as a second display. Well, fear not, as OMG Ubuntu has tested ways to make that happen, and it looks like it's actually super easy. Using RDP, which is built into GNOME since GNOME 42, along with screen sharing, you can extend your desktop to a virtual monitor, such as an iPad. 
and actually use that iPad as a second display that doesn't just replicate your desktop, but acts like a complete monitor. It also uses hardware acceleration and in-frame tracking, so the experience is really fluid and nice, although your network connection will need to not be too crappy for that to work reliably. You will also need to run a G-Settings command to ensure that this feature is enabled, as it's not currently considered polished enough by GNOME devs to be available by default. Pretty neat feature! I'll have to try that with my Galaxy Tab S8 Plus, I'm sure it will work super well. Although I will need to wait to get back home to do that, because the Wi-Fi here is dreadful. Adobe had already released a version of Photoshop that ran in a web browser a while ago. It's not feature complete, and it was mostly aimed at collaborating on minor edits to a document, and it was limited to paid subscribers or people invited by paid subscribers. It looks like this might change, as Photoshop on the web might end up being free for everyone. This is now in testing in Canada, where all you need to use Photoshop on the web is a free Adobe account. And the goal is to expand that to the world once the test is complete, with more advanced features being limited to paid customers. Adobe still expects that all core functions of Photoshop will be available for free users, so people who don't need it professionally can still use it, whatever the OS they're using. Their end game is, of course, to hook users with a free product, and make them move to the full desktop version once they've outgrown the features they get for free. Still, it's really cool, as it means that people who only dabble in Photoshop and think they need Photoshop for everything that they do, can actually stick to what they know, and more professional users still get to go use Windows, I guess, to use the full desktop version. I do hope that they include enough of the premium features in the free version so that it's actually a useful tool and not something that you could replace with like paint.net or Pinta or something. Yet more tools are coming to Linux, as AMD announced they are now supporting their Radeon Memory Visualizer on our OS of choice. This thing is a tool that lets developers solve video memory problems and analyze the usage of VRAM on Radeon GPUs, so they can ensure that their titles are optimized for the platform. They're only officially supporting Ubuntu 20.04 for now, which is weird, but there is no reason that the tool wouldn't work on other distros as well, as long as all dependencies are met. The experience seems to be identical to the Windows version, which is nice, and it already lets developers analyze Vulkan applications on Linux. Why did they port this to Linux? Well, they cite the rising popularity of gaming on the Linux OS. If I may interject, AMD, Linux is just a kernel, it's not an OS. But, but jokes and pedantry aside, it's good to see that these tools are making their way to Linux. And I hope that they bring their more gamer, consumer-focused AMD Radeon software suite to Linux as well. That would be really nice. You didn't really think I would publish one of these news videos without including the latest updates to GNOME apps, did you? This week, GNOME Software gets an uninstall option for its command line, and Amberall, the new music player that still sounds like medicine, now joined GNOME Circle officially, getting into that quite open list of unofficial but endorsed GNOME apps. Authenticator, an app that lets you generate authentication codes, now supports Google Authenticator. Workbench, the sandbox to learn and test GNOME technologies, now supports Vala. It can preview templates and signal handlers, and includes all the icons you might need. Finally, Fosh, the mobile shell developed by Purism, also got swipe gestures for the top and bottom bar, and has better quick settings. People keep telling me that these updates are very small, but keep in mind that these are weekly updates, as in they've been done over the past 5 to 7 days, and I think that's nothing to scoff at. Let's not leave out KDE either, as they've not only released Plasma 5.25, but they've also been working on the new features that we'll enjoy in 4 months. One 15-minute bug has been resolved, and Plasma gets support for changing the wallpaper when switching to a dark theme, so you can have these nice dual wallpapers that have a light and a dark variant. Arc, the archiving tool, will check to see if there's enough disk space before unarchiving something. System settings pages get more priority in the search results from the menu or K-Runner, and you can now drag windows between screens in the overview 
and the present windows effect. Breeze buttons no longer have a gradient until you hover over them, giving a little flatter look and the analog clock now respects your accent color on top of now supporting your color scheme entirely. These guys just never stop and Plasma 5.26 is gearing up to be another amazing release and I would expect it to fix all the small little issues that I noticed in my 5.25 review. At least the developers told me that they would probably be fixed. A new Linux malware has been discovered by researchers and this one is a bit concerning as it's not specifically new, it's very mature and very adept at concealing itself on infected servers, which makes it quite hard to detect. It can scrub all signs of infection on the infected file system, on the system processes and on the network traffic. It's called Symbiote and has been targeting financial institutions in Brazil. Its first detection was in November and it works by infecting other processes. It's not an app, it's a library that loads itself when running other programs using preload. And once it has infected all running processes, it provides rootkit functionality to the person who needs it with the ability to harvest credentials and access the server remotely. Pretty concerning stuff, even though it's not stated to be super widespread at the moment. Although since it seems to be super capable at hiding itself, it's really hard to know. Users of Calendar, one of the best looking calendar and tasks app, not only on KDE, but on Linux as a whole, will be happy to know that the contact manager is being revamped quite nicely. The contact view will look a hell of a lot nicer with a nice contact list better sorted and the contact details page being a lot better laid out as well. The settings now have access to the same sources as the current contact module so WebDAV, Exchange or local vCard files, and you can share contacts by generating a QR code. There's also a Plasma applet in the works to let you search for your contacts and send them an email or call them using KD Connect. The contact editor is still lacking a lot of features, but it's progressing nicely as well. It also supports contact groups. Calendar is shaping up nicely to be a full replacement for contact, the Outlook replacement suite for KDE. All it needs now is an email and a notes module and basically you'll get everything you need and probably something that I will use even on my GNOME systems. Yeah, it's that good. Even a consistency nerd like me would drop their principles to use that app. It's really nice. Cinnamon 5.4 has been tagged for release and it will be available for Linux Mint 21, codenamed Vanessa, this summer. Of course, it can also be integrated by other distributions as well. 5.4 comes 7 months after the previous release and brings a bunch of new stuff. It has a newer, more stable window manager that more closely follows GNOME's Mutter, so it will be easier to update in the future. 5.4 also brings the ability to copy system info to the clipboard for easier bug reporting, better fractional scaling, better hot corner setup, support for application actions in the menu, as well as support for logical monitors improved keyboard navigation in the menu and a ton of bug fixes on the various applets this desktop environment provides. I'll give it a good look when Min 21 is released, so stay tuned for that and don't forget to subscribe of course. You know that little red button in the bottom of the video that actually doesn't guarantee that you'll see my videos in your feed? Just click it! Fairphone is an initiative that I really like, trying to build a completely repairable and user serviceable smartphone all while compensating workers fairly and limiting the impact on the environment. I used the Fairphone 4 for a while when reviewing the latest release of Slash EOS, and while that phone doesn't suit my own personal needs, it's still a pretty cool device. Well, users that want to use a Fairphone will now have access to a subscription service that turns the model on its head. The more you keep your phone, the less expensive it becomes, with monthly discounts every year you keep your phone, as long as it's undamaged, since you will have to send it back at the end of the contract so it can be properly recycled. Plans start at 21 euros per month, and after the third year it will only cost you 13 euros once the discount for long ownership comes into play. And once you finally change your phone for something else, you can rest assured that they will recycle it properly, which is a nice plus. It's a pretty great initiative, and I would love to see Fairphone making a more 
flagship level device with a high refresh rate screen and better specs. I would be very willing to pay a premium for that. Proton 7.0-3 was released by Valve directly inside of Steam to help you get even more game support on Linux and on the Steam Deck. This new release adds a ton of playable games like Beneath a Steel Sky, Make Warrior Online, Warhammer N Times Vermintide, Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, or We Were Here Forever, among a ton of others. Of course, it includes the latest DXVK, Mono, and DXVK NV API, so compatibility is the best it can be. It also includes a lot of bug fixes for Elden Ring, Deathloop, The Turing Test, Resident Evil Revelations 2, as well as for video playback in a lot of titles using VP8 and VP9 codecs. The Windows Gaming Input API is now supported as well, and steering wheels detection should now be much better. And yes, I am still amazed at the pace of these incredible updates and at the pace at which game support on Linux is evolving. It's just amazing work. Amazing, just like today's sponsor, Tuxedo. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany. They make laptops and desktops that have the nice particularity that they run Linux out of the box. You can pick a few distros from their website or install your own, just like I did on my Stellaris 15, which is a device I'm definitely buying and which you can expect a review for in the very, very near future. I've actually been editing all my videos since the Plasma 5.25 video on it, and it's been amazing. But they also make like smaller ultrabooks or NUX or high-end gaming workstation desktops and very, very powerful laptops. And they have plenty of cool projects, like for example, an external water cooling solution for the Stellaris 15 that I use and that I hope I can review once they've got their Linux drivers up and running. So if you need a new device that runs Linux out of the box and you want to make sure that Linux runs well on the device that you're going to buy, check out the link in the description below and get your new device from Tuxedo. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, you can also dislike it. And tell me why in the comments as well. It's just more civilized this way. And if you want to help me offset the cost of all the work I have done in my apartment, which explains why I'm not currently in my office, well, you can always donate using the super thanks button, the PayPal link in the description, or by joining my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both of them get access to a weekly podcast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!